So today we'll be presenting on chapter two of the book, Idols of the Mind versus True Reality. This second chapter is titled Idols of the Mind versus True Reality. Um, so again, anyone interested in uh, reaching out to the Bhaktivedanta Institute who published this book can use the contact information on the screen. Our serving director, Sripad Bhakti Madhavapur Maharaj is the author of this book. And today we'll be presenting on the second chapter. <clears throat> the first section of the book is called Reason, Uncertainty, and Unknowing. Modern science, as we know it today, had its beginnings in the Christian West because of a faith that reason or rational principles could be found in God's creation, nature. Reason is a personal feature found in man. A world that is created by a rational being must also possess this personal feature, which we call God. It is possible that an atheistic culture would have never conceived reason in the world and therefore failed to develop science. So I'm starting with this because this is a huge point. Um, the fact that nature is coherent and we can understand it means that there is reason there's rationality behind it and we have some access to deciphering that reason um, as we've presented on before uh, in the past many 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 of the founding fathers so to speak of modern science uh, they were all theistic so they were all um, looking into the reason behind nature's uh, workings in order to come to know God, actually. So here we have a quote um, regarding Sir Isaac Newton. Isaac Newton's goal was incomparably more, uh, more vast than the discovery of the mathematical principles of natural philosophy. Newton wished to penetrate to the divine principles beyond the veil of nature and beyond the veils of human record and received revelation as well. His goal was the knowledge of God, and for achieving that goal, he marshaled the evidence from every source available to him. Mathematics, experiment, observation, reason, revelation, historical record, myth, the tattered remnants of ancient wisdom. So in mathematics, the n body problem for n is greater than two bodies interacting according to an inverse square law was well known to Newton. This played a great role in his conception of the order and stability of the solar system. The later development of chaos theory by Poincaré and others recognizes this problem as well as perturbations and initial condition errors that are fundamental to computer simulated stability calculations over reiterations of billions of years. Through these methods, it has been found that ejections and collisions are possible within 5 billion years. Newton's prescient uncertainty about this led him to state, for while comets move in very eccentric orbs in all manner of positions, blind fate could never make all the planets move one in the same way in orbs concentric. Some inconsiderable irregularities accepted, which may have arisen from the mutual actions of comets and planets on one another and which will be apt to increase till the system wants a reformation. So this is just showing uh, how someone as important as Newton uh, in modern science today, even, um, he could understand that chaos is what results from um, a lack of order. And the fact that the cosmos is very much ordered and there's much less chaos than one would think if everything was just going on randomly. Uh, the fact that the cosmos is ordered means that there is some intelligence behind it. Newton himself said like that. Uh, he, included, he included that in his book, The Principia, even. He says, uh, this is from The Principia. This most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets 
could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent being. This being governs all things, not as the soul of the world, but as Lord over all. And on account of his dominion, he is wont to be called Lord God, Pantocrator, or universal ruler. The Supreme God is a being eternal, infinite, and absolutely perfect. So all of the knowledge that Newton uh, provided to the world it uh, was drawn from a context which had God at the center. And like we showed you before, uh, many of the founding fathers of science had the same goal and they had the same context. They were working within an ordered rational creation of a rational supreme being. So now it's important to show um, many times in the presentations in the past, we've talked about humility, the importance of humility, intellectual humility, and how uh, in order to acquire truth, rational truth of reality, one has to have a humble disposition and other virtues. So this is demonstrating that uh, modern scientists and uh, scientists from the past all demonstrated this kind of humility, starting again with Newton. I do not know what I may appear to the world, but to myself I seem to have been only like a boy playing on the seashore and diverting myself and now and then finding a smoother pebble or prettier shell than ordinary, whilst the great ocean of truth uh, lay all undiscovered before me. Einstein said, the human mind is not capable of grasping the universe. We are like a child entering a huge library. The walls are covered to the ceilings with books in many different tongues. The child knows that someone must have written these books. It does not know who or how. It does not understand the languages in which they are written. But the child notes a definite plan in the arrangement of the books, a mysterious order which, does not, uh, which it does not comprehend, but only dimly suspects. Uh, this is a quote from uh, Idols of the Mind and then a quote embedded from that text. Werner Heisenberg gave us the famous uncertainty principle. It does not refer to some limitation of our knowing measuring capacity, but to an intrinsic ambiguity in reality that cannot be overcome. This point is also made by J.B.S. Haldane. Uh, so for those who don't know, J.B.S. Haldane is a scientist credited as one of the main contributors of the modern synthesis for evolution and genetics. He said, now my own suspicion is that the universe is not only queerer than we suppose, but queerer than we can suppose. Uh, Fred Hoyle, who is um, who, who's a, an astro uh, astrologist, um, he coined the term the Big Bang that everybody knows. He said that there is a coherent plan to the universe, though I don't know what it's a plan for. So all of these scientists took a very um, humble position as they were trying to uh, rationally move through their observations of nature and see the connection and see uh, what, what is the meaning of these connections and, and observations? Um, for those who are interested to hear more about intellectual humility and its importance and uh, the different ways that uh, it's being applied uh, now, they can go to this video. Uh, we talked about it last semester. So now we're going to talk about why is that ambiguity there in reality? That um, why, why don't humans just have the capacity to know everything exactly as it is, uh, just from their own effort alone? Why, why can't they do that? We, why can't we do that? So Anaxagoras um, was a pre-Socratic philosopher uh, living in 500 to 480 BC. So, you know, around 2,500 years ago, 
And he is the first one, I believe, who talked about um, this noose, the intellect or a mind that was the motivation behind the entire cosmos. So just like we read the quote already of Panto Crater that uh, Isaac Newton talked about Panto Crater being the one who is actually controlling the cosmos, the, the movements of the celestial bodies, keeping them in fixed orbits that are, you know, rational patterns. So this idea has it was existing even way before Newton uh, by this Anaxagoras. And then in our modern times, this same idea has been talked about by George Wald. Uh, he is a Nobel laureate who, um, he, he won his prize in physiology. He said, a few years ago, it occurred to me that these two problems, a universe that breeds life by overcoming obstacles with many special tricks and a consciousness that has no location could be put together. At the time, I was both elated and embarrassed. I was embarrassed because the thought seemed so strange to me as a scientist. But I was also elated because as an experimentalist, I have learned that if an experiment gives you a beautiful result, enjoy it. Heaven knows whether such results will ever happen again. At any rate, within a couple of weeks, I realized that I was in the best of company. What was the thought? Previously, I had always thought of consciousness or mind as something that required a particularly complex central nervous system and was present only in the highest organisms. The thought now was that mind had been there all the time. And the reason this life breeding universe is that uh, the pervasive, uh, so I'm sorry, the reason that this is a life breeding universe is that the pervasive constant presence of mind had guided the universe that way. So George, Law, uh, George Wald, well, you know, is a, a very good scientist, the contemporary of Einstein and, and the founders of quantum theory. And this is his conclusion. Uh, you know, at the end of his life, in 1989, this book was written, and I think he passed on a few years later, a couple of years later. So this was his conclusion after his whole life of science. And as we just showed you, uh, Isaac Newton thought the same way, and even thousands of years before that, Anaxagoras uh, thought that way also. So this is not something new. This is a rational conclusion that individuals are coming to who are not so committed to a materialistic worldview. So the question is, um, how or why has today's modern science turned away from and failed to comprehend this reason in the world? Now this is uh, the next section in the book, Idols of the Mind versus True Reality. It's called Explanation and Correspondence. If we carefully consider what science is doing here, we discover that anthropocentric or egocentric conceptions of reality, reality as it is for us or for me, are being erected in place of true reality as it is by itself and for itself. It seeks and may have some correspondence with true reality. And if the subjective conception corresponds with the objective reality, the truth is considered to have been reached. This is called the correspondence theory of truth. However, there are problems with this, as we noted above, in that different theories may have some correspondence with objective observations, and yet still refer to a different imagined reality. Atomic theory and quantum theory provide imagined wonderlands that possess some observations or correspondence with true reality. To some degree, each is logical, self-consistent, and complete, although Godel would object to either being at the same time consistent and complete. Eclipses of the sun were once predicted using geocentric epicycles of Pelotomy. They are now described in terms of heliocentric orbits of Copernicus. Some ancients knew that they could chase away the moon dog from eating the sun god whenever they would beat their gongs. Every time they did it, it worked, so that uh, they concluded it correlated with the truth. So what this is saying, or pointing out, is that science begins with looking at nature. Uh, actually, it doesn't even begin there. It, it begins with um, these axioms. 
such as reductionist approaches or materialism, that all material phenomena is coming from something that's material. These are all axioms that can't be proven empirically. They're just accepted in the mind before you even start observing nature. <clears throat> so here we have a little picture of a scientist, right? Looking under a microscope and um, in reality, the scientist does look into a cell and they see DNA, different molecules. Those are physical phenomena that's there inside life, inside a cell, right? You only find atoms, molecules of DNA, et cetera. You only find these things inside life, inside a living cell. But then uh, the scientist jumps from the observation within the context uh, of observed reality. Then they, you know, say something like, uh, life is reducible to matter, that the accumulation of matter, here we have, you know, a DNA chain plus a DNA chain, just as a symbolic representation, equals a person, saying that the accumulation and complexity of material uh, interactions of the accumulation of matter all of a sudden spontaneously generates life. That, that's an idol of the mind. That's, <laughs> that's not observed. That's not what we experience. That is just a, a mental concoction, essentially. So in the quotes that we just read before, we read about the, uh, the moon dog eating the sun god. The Chinese used to have this belief. Uh, so what was observed empirically was that during an eclipse, during, you know, when the sun was in front of the moon, uh, I'm sorry, the moon in front of the sun, uh, they would bang the gong at the time when the moon was moving away from the sun. So it is true that when they hit the gong, the moon moved away from the sun, but their idol of the mind, their conclusion that uh, the conclusion of the eclipse was dependent upon the beating of their gong, that was just a mental concoction. That was an idol of the mind. It started with something that was an observation of reality, and then they just concocted something from correlation. They said something ridiculous, <laughs> a ridiculous conclusion. We have one more example. Uh, the story that we've mentioned many times, not the story, but, but the parable of the six blind men and the elephant. They don't know it's an elephant beforehand, and each of them touched a different part of the elephant. So they come up with, you know, they, one who touches the ears, they think it's a fan. One who touches the body, think it's a brick wall. Who touches the leg, thinks it's tree trunks. Who touches the trunk thinks it's a cobra who touches the tr um, the tusks thinks they're spears and one who touches the tail thinks it's a rope they have no idea of the whole they don't know the elephant they're just having an isolated empirical experience of something with no prior conceptual context and then they just imagine something so then when they all come together and they put together uh, their experience this is the idol of the mind. This is the reality which they think uh, is true when in fact it's not. So these are all examples of starting with a, a real observation, but then just going uh, in a nonsensical direction based off of fantasy, essentially, getting carried away. So this is just showing idols of the mind versus true reality. Measurable properties are observations of true reality that we perceive and incorporate into the realm of our subjectively constructed theory, ideas, or idols, which we think allow us to explain the original objects of true reality. Of course, scientific measurement only involves the quantitative, superficial, outer husk of things. Thus, it cannot give us a genuine explanation of the essence that courses, for instance, through a blade of grass, producing and making it what it is. Um, so this is, you know, our, our servant director, Shripad Bhakti Madhava Puri Maharaj is, is famous for this saying of his, without all our, uh, with all our science, all the scientists in the world together cannot make a single blade of grass. And that's a fact. Uh, we observe life all around us. You can say complex life, human beings, and also very basic forms of life, such as a blade of grass. And science postulates many things about life, but 
clearly, uh, if, if they are postulating that life is reducible to matter, but they cannot construct life from putting matter together, then you can't conclude that that's correct. And you have no basis for putting that forward, actually. It's, it's just uh, spreading ignorance. It's, if, if you can put chemical A, B, and C together in a, in, a, in a Petri dish and then make a blade of grass, a living blade of grass, which can do everything that grass does in nature, right? Grass reproduces itself. Uh, it has the photosynthetic process, so many things that grass is naturally doing in nature. That cannot be reproduced at all. Maybe they can clone it, no problem, but uh, that's still starting with what God has given, actually, right? It's, it's starting with the blade of grass that's alive. In order to claim that life is reducible to matter, you have to then demonstrate that you're taking matter and, and building life, and that has never been done. There's been some misdirection. Uh, but all those misdirection, if you look closely, it starts with something that was already living. Never, not once in the history of mankind has uh, life ever been constructed from matter. So that's very important detail. Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. This is just uh, demonstrating that. The simplicity of the blade of grass, yet it's not accessible. It cannot be made by us. That's a very beautiful thing. That is the glorification of God's divine ability. You know, it's very nice actually. <clears throat> Newton's conception of the solar system considered God necessary to guide the alchemical vitality that was intrinsic to the order and movement in the universe. The mathematical bones of Newton's Principia Mathematica were taken by modern physics and presented as a mechanical model of the universe without the Pantocrator. Of course, Newton himself wrote his mathematical section as a whole and uh, surreptitiously included his remarks about Pantocrator only in the appendix or the scholium. Um, so this is now, this is what we said in the beginning of the presentation that what modern science is today is that elephant. This, the elephant here, this is modern science because it's taken, um, or this is the image or concept of reality that modern science puts forward. Uh, and it's not congruent with what reality actually is. Um, and, and the point of that quote that we just read about physics taking the bones of Newton's ideas, they didn't take the whole. Newton was looking at a context, at a whole. He was looking at a, uh, he was looking at the whole, and all the parts were within the context of that whole. So, if you just take the part abstractly and then consider it by itself, and concoct whatever you want with your mind, this is what you get. You get this weird elephant with the snake on his face. <laughs> um, but that's not what reality is. And it's very easy to see that um, when, for instance, we talk about DNA, um, you know, like uh, repairing itself and, and uh, transcribing. These are things that take cognitive function. So if we're not admitting that there is cognitive ability within the cell in order for DNA to repair itself and transcribe, but we're saying that DNA repairs itself and transcribes. And there is just a, like a gap that's not explained, is super ambiguous and doesn't really make much sense because those processes require cognition. To repair something, to transcribe something requires that you have a concept of what you, you conceive of something that is broken and then you're, you're repairing something. And there are videos of cells doing that, uh, of repairing parts of themselves. And it's very interesting to watch that. Uh, 
because it gives you an idea of something that's beyond just the materialistic worldview. So our story or history or his story, uh, instead of just concocting our own story of what reality is, what the uh, natural philosophers who founded modern science and who many of the Eastern cultures, such as the Vedic culture, they are not interested in just creating a mental concoction of reality, accepting that as true and living in that concoction. What they're interested in is the true reality, the reality that I was born into and am an organic participant or organic part of. What is that reality and, and how do I operate within that? How do I participate in that in a very full and conscious way? So our servant director, Sri Pad Bhakti Madhavapuri Maharaj always points out that uh, history is actually his story, you know, God's story, not our story. So um, eminent scientists have clearly warned us about the difference between nature as it is for us versus its purposeful reality for itself, in addition to warning us about accepting our idols of the mind as true reality. In the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum theory, we can indeed proceed without mentioning ourselves as individuals, but we cannot disregard the fact that natural science is formed by men. Natural science does not simply describe and explain nature, it is a part of the interplay between nature and ourselves, it describes nature as exposed to our method of questioning. This was a possibility of which Descartes could not have thought, but it makes a sharp separation between the world and the eye impossible. If one follows with great difficulty, which even eminent scientists like Einstein had in understanding and accepting the Copenhagen interpretation, one can trace the roots to the Cartesian partition. It will take a long time for it this partition, to be replaced by a really different attitude toward the problem of reality. This was Werner Heisenberg who said that. He was one of the uh, founding, um, founding fathers of quantum theory. <clears throat> now, this is from, um, from Bacon, from Francis Bacon. The name of this book and the name of this chapter, Idols of the Mind versus True Reality. Idols of the Mind is something that uh, Bacon uh, came up with. So first, he talks about idols of the tribe, innate to a finite man. Deceptions of the subjective mind and imperfect senses are intrinsic to us. Mere imaginations gain the dignity of reality and are mixed with facts so that they become inseparable. Idols are molded from these compounds. Idols of the cave, the well of an individual mind. An individual who is dedicated to some particular branch of learning interprets everything according to the colors of his own narrow field of experience. If the only tool you have is a hammer, you treat everything as a nail. Idols of the marketplace, semantics or words. Words make private thoughts public. But when the bombastic words are substituted for thoughts, one believes he can convince his opponents by out-talking them. This arises from pure vanity that drags the dignity of philosophy and science into the mud. Idols of the theater, sophistry. Putting on a show, arguing in terms of popular familiarities that are false. What is obvious or familiar has not been carefully thought through. Thus, what is familiar is not on the account necessarily known. So what is true reality as it is by itself and for itself? And how do we consciously participate in a harmonious way? So before going to this, just to reiterate that last point that uh, what we're presenting here is something that contemporary, modern, mainstream scientists, important ones, all acknowledged and were aware of and spoke about to some extent. So it's important to just be aware of that at the very least.
This is the third section of this chapter. God, the universal I, is also self-conscious and not merely consciousness. So the, the question that we're asking first is, what is the true reality as it is by itself and for itself? How do we consciously participate in a harmonious way? Wisdom is not a property of the universe, although we find life and intelligence in the universe, in nature. It is a quality of a person, the divine personality of Godhead. Just as consciousness and intelligence pervade our body's activities, so God's personal energy pervades and forms the whole reality with life and intelligence. Not only does religion teach surrender of our false egos to the true reality of God, but also teaches us how to learn the truth by attending to the revelation of it. Uh, rather than encouraging the tendency to impose and project one's self-imaginings onto reality, taking oneself as a separate subjective agent against passive objectivity that lacks its own agency and ability to reveal itself. Reality, as possessing personal agency, can reveal God's self to us if we adapt, uh, adopt the attentive patience that allows the veils of self-centered egotism to dissolve by the practice of meditation, surrender, and service. This is bhakti yoga. So I just want to call uh, attention back to um, before when we read of um, Anaxagoras from 2,500 years ago when he was also uh, thinking that the cosmos, he could understand and, and uh, see the reason behind and, and see the intelligence that governed the universe, that governed nature, governed reality. And then 2,500 years later, George Walt, uh, a modern scientist who just passed away a couple of decades ago, um, he also saw that. And that was his conclusion after a life of rigorous materialistic science actually he was a he was an atheist in the beginning of his scientific endeavor and by the end of it uh, he had quite a different perspective uh, it's also worth noting that george wald um, actually uh, he had a very significant encounter with our serving director shripad bhakti madhavapuri maharaj um, in boston at mit um, George Wald was giving a lecture and our director was there, serving director was there. And he said to George Wald, you know, why do you think that life comes from matter? Why don't you consider that matter comes from life the other way around? He just said something very simple like that. Um, and George Wald, somehow it, it really hit him and he thought about it. And a couple of years later, uh, you know, they began interacting in a much more uh, intimate way. And George Wald started to really uh, think about that perspective. And that's what led him to the kind of conclusion that we read before, um, that intelligence is all pervading in reality, that intelligence and life are all pervading. So here, uh, reality as it, uh, reality as by itself and for itself, means that the absolute is its own origin, the cause of itself, or cause of sui, as Spinoza called it, and has its own purposes for itself. Thus, reality cannot be impersonal. To judge good and bad by our self-centered perspectives will not bring us closer to truth, but entangle us further in the misconception of separate interest. This is something each individual has to understand for themselves to try to force another to this conclusion, is itself something that can only arise from misconception and lead one further into delusion. So the a nice takeaway from these last two slides is that beyond the reason that we try to put on reality, besides the reason that we try to give to ourselves, there is already a reason there. And we're already participating in that. That reason is uh, what created us in the first place. Not just 
in this bodily conception of life, but as a spirit, as a soul. <clears throat> and the, re the purpose of life is to try to harmonize with that uh, divine reason. This is the perspective of the Vedic wisdom and of bhakti yoga. Bhakti yoga is the practice, the practical um, application of the philosophy to everyday life. Um, so this last sentence here, trying to force another to that conclusion is itself something that can only arise from misconception. Um, so we have free will and that is absolutely necessary for full conscious participation in that reason that is beyond us, that divine reason. Um, and we need to cho uh, freely choose that. And if we are not at the place in our life or development where we can choose to uh, have a desire to go beyond just the, uh, like a shallow materialistic life, we don't have that desire and we cannot be forced to do that because it will only cause problems. Uh, and if anyone tries to force anybody else, that individual is themselves um, under delusion because we are not the controllers that's that's the point we are not the controllers uh we should try to humbly see what is beyond us and and, and what is controlling us this is what newton called panto crater right the controller of the cosmos <clears throat> so this is essentially where we stop um for this presentation there are uh three more sections in this chapter of the book um, free will and the fall, I and mine, reality has its own purpose in and for itself. And this just elaborates on these last points on uh, once we can acknowledge that maybe much of what we have accepted as the truth are actually idols of the mind. Once we can accept that kind of idea and then we start to have a natural free desire to question and pursue true reality. That's what these last three sections talk about. What is the nature of free will? Uh, what is our identity? Uh, what is our false identity? What is our real identity? And then what is the purpose of reality, of God, by and for God's self? And, and what role do we play in that as agents with free will, conscious living agents with free will? And that's all kind of summed up, actually, in this little diagram. This is the last part. Um, right, right now, many of us are living in this circle on the left. You know, our field of of consciousness of our uh, what we think is real is this circle on the outside, and we are at the center of that. We think that we are at the center. Uh, we're calling this the egocentric false ego, and uh, our the idea we're trying to communicate is that uh, more adequate and, and a true reality, a true perspective is more like this circle on the right, where we are somewhere within the whole of reality. And we have a relationship to the center, but we are not the center, right? That center would be the supreme personality of God. God, And, and the whole reality, uh, we are there, we are a part, we are a participant, but we are not the whole, we are not the center. And our purpose is derived from understanding our relation to the center, to the whole. So we'll end the presentation there. Um, and I just want to real quick um, mention this activity for anyone who uh, might see this and is interested. Lydia, if you're interested, please uh, let me know. Um, it's a research project that the Bhaktivedanta Institute is doing. It's an evaluation a two-step evaluation we're trying to engage um, students and faculty of university in. <clears throat> the Bhaktivedanta Institute of Spiritual Culture and Science is a 501c3 charitable nonprofit educational organization in Princeton, New Jersey, USA. Uh, and we're seeking to engage students and academic professionals in an educational initiative, which aims to answer the following question. In a global culture increasingly influenced by Newtonian scientific materialist worldview and a neoliberal political philosophy, 
What interest is there in learning more about a post-materialist science and the meta-modern possibilities of a transcendent reality that are either ignored or rejected by modern and post-modern theorists? The Princeton BVI SES intends to conduct a two-step evaluation, which requests participants to thoughtfully respond to the open-ended questions mentioned in the following page. Step one, this is a two-step evaluation. Step one, participants will respond to the questions as they are written below and email responses to Princeton at BVI SES.org. Participants will then receive the same questions with an additional preamble, which provides a conceptual context based on Eastern and Western wisdom regarding how each question is relevant to considering the harmony of science and religion and the role of consciousness in science. Step two, six to eight participants will meet together via Zoom to discuss their thoughts about the questions in light of this new conceptual context. About 20 minutes will be allotted for the discussion of each question for a total of 120 minutes. The Zoom meeting will conclude with each participant providing another written response to the questions in light of whatever new realizations they may have gained from the preambles and the discussion process. The Zoom meeting will be two and a half hours altogether. In order to ensure fair and amicable participation, Dr. Joan Walton, senior lecturer in the School of Education at York St. John University in the United Kingdom, will be moderating the Zoom discussion. Depending on the level of continued interest after this two-step evaluation, opportunities for further engagement will be discussed. We humbly feel that continuing productive dialogue concerning these topics is paramount for the positive progression of modern science and scholarship in general. So I won't read the questions, um, but I'll just have them here on the screen real quick. So if you're interested in this, uh, please feel free to reach out, uh, email princeton at bviscs.org. And um, that's everything for today.